chapters eleven and twelve of and then the town took off by richard wilson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom weiss chapter eleven a submarine surfaced on the atlantic far below superior it was obvious to the commander of the submarine which bore the markings of the soviet union that the runaway town of superior being populated entirely by capitalist madmen was a menace to humanity the submarine commander made a last-minute check to the radio room then gave the order to launch the guided missiles which would rid the world of this menace the first missile sped skyward superior immediately took evasive action first in its terrific burst of acceleration everybody was knocked flat next superior sped upward for a few hundred feet and everybody was crushed to the ground at the same time the first missile which was now where superior would have been had it maintained its original course exploded a miniature mushroom cloud formed the submarine fired again and a second missile streaked up superior dodged again but this time its direction was down everybody who was outdoors and a few who had been under thin roofs found himself momentarily suspended in space don and alice among the hundreds who had had the ground snatched out from under them clung to each other and began to fall all around them were the various adversaries who had been about to clash professor garrett had been separated from his machine and they were following separate downward orbits many of theobald's men had dropped their guns but others clung to them as if it were better to cling to something than merely to fall the downward swoop of superior had taken it out of the immediate path of the second missile, but whoever had changed the townoid's course had apparently failed to take the inhabitants' inertia into immediate consideration. The missile was headed into their midst. Then two things happened. The missile exploded well away from the falling people, and scores of kangaroo-like gizzles appeared from everywhere and began to snatch people to safety. Great jumps carried the gizzles into the air and they collected three or four human beings at each leap. The leaps appeared to defy gravity, carrying the creatures hundreds of feet up. The gizzles also appeared to have the faculty of changing course while airborne, saving their charges from other loose objects, but this might have been illusion. At any rate, Geneva Jervis, who had been hurled up from the roof of Hector's place, where she had gone in hopes of catching a glimpse of Senator Thebold, was reunited with the senator when they were rescued by the same gizzle whose leap had carried him in a great arc virtually from one edge of superior to the other don court pressed close to alice and grasped securely across the hairy chest of their particular rescuer was experiencing a combination of sensations one of course was relief at being snatched from certain death another was the delicious closeness of alice who he realized he hadn't been paying enough attention to, in a personal way. Another was surprised at the number of gizzles who had appeared in the moment of crisis. Finally, he saw beyond doubt that it was the gizzles who were running the entire show, that Hector I, Bobby the Bold, and the pseudo-scientific Garrett Ruback Axis were merely strutters on the stage. It was the gizzles who were maneuvering superior as if it were a giant vehicle. It was the gizzles who were exploding the missile, and it was the alien gizzles who, unlike the would-be belligerents among the earth people, were scrupulously saving human lives. Thanks, Don said to his rescuing gizzle as it set him and Alice down gently on the hard ground of the golf course. Don't mention it, the gizzle said, then leaped off to save others. He talked, Alice said. Don watched the gizzle make a mid-air grab and haul back a man who had looked as if he might otherwise have gone over the edge. He certainly did. Then that must have been a masquerade that other time, all that mumbo-jumbo with the anagrams. It must have been, unless they learned awfully fast. He and Alice clutched each other again as Superior tilted. It remained steady otherwise, and they were able to see the ocean, whose surface was marked with splashes as a variety of loose objects fell into it. Don had a glimpse of Professor Garrett's machine plummeting down in the midst of most of Superior's vehicular population. There's a plane, Alice cried. It's going after something on the surface. It's the Hustler, Don said. 
It's after the submarine. The B-58's long pod detached itself, became a guided missile, and hit the submarine square in the middle. There was a whooshing explosion, the B-58 banked and disappeared from sight under Superior, and the sub went down. Sergeant Cork, a voice said, and because Alice was lying with her head on Don's chest, she heard, Is that somebody talking to you, Don? Are you a sergeant? I'm afraid so, he said. I'll have to explain later. Sergeant Cork here, he said to the Pentagon. Things are getting out of hand, Sergeant, the voice of Captain Simmons said. Captain, that's the understatement of the week. Whatever it is, we can't allow the people of Superior to be endangered any longer. No, sir. Is there another submarine? Not as far as we know. I'm talking about the state of anarchy in Superior itself, with each of three factions vying for power, four counting the kangaroos. They're not kangaroos, sir. They're gizzles. Whatever they are. You and I know they're creatures from some other world, and I've managed to persuade the Chief of Staff that this is the case. He's in seeing the Defense Secretary right now, but the State Department isn't buying it. You mean they don't believe in the Gizzle? They don't believe they're interplanetary. Their whole orientation at State is toward international trouble. Anything interplanetary sends them into a complete flap. We can't even get them to discuss the exploration of the moon, and that's practically around the corner. What shall we do, sir? Between you and me, Sergeant, Captain Simmons' voice interrupted itself. Never mind that. Here comes the defense secretary. Foghorn Frank? Don asked. Shh! Frank Fogarty had earned his nickname in his younger years when he commanded a tugboat in New York Harbor. That was before his quick rise in the shipbuilding industry, where he got the reputation as a wartime expediter that led to his cabinet appointment. Is this the gadget? Don heard Fogarty say. Yes, sir. Okay, Sergeant Court, Fogarty boomed. Can you hear me? It was no wonder they called him Foghorn. Yes, sir, Don said, wincing. Fine, you're doing a top-notch job. Don't think I don't know what's been going on. I've heard the tapes. Now, son, are you ready for a little action? We're going to stir them up at state. Yes, sir, Don said again. Good, then stand up. No, better not if Superior is still gyrating. Just raise your right hand and I'll give you a field promotion to Major. Temporary, of course. I can do that, can I, General? Apparently the Chief of Staff was there and agreed. Right, Fogarty said. Now, Sergeant, repeat after me. Don, too overwhelmed to say anything else, repeated after him. Now then, Major Court, we're going to present the State Department with what they would call a fait accompli. You are now military governor of Superior, son, with all the power of the U.S. defense establishment behind you. A C-97 troop carrier plane is loading. I'll give you the ETA as soon as I know it. A hundred paratroopers. Arrange to meet them at the golf course near the blimp. And if Senator Thebold tries to interfere, well, handle him tactfully. But I think he'll go along. He's got his headlines, and by now he should have been able to find his missing lady friend. Help him in that personal matter if you can. As for Hector Civic and Osborne Garrett, be firm. I don't think they'll give you any trouble. But, sir, Don said, aren't you underestimating the Gizzles? If they see paratroops landing, they're liable to get unfriendly fast. May I make a suggestion? Shoot, son. Well, sir, I think I'd better go try to have a talk with them and see if we can't work something out without a show of force. If you could hold off the troops till I ask for them, Foghorn Frank said, want to make a deal, eh? If you can do it, fine. But since State isn't willing to admit that there's such a thing as an intelligent kangaroo, alien or otherwise, any little deals you can make with them will have to be unofficial for the time being. All right, I'll hold off on the paratroopers. The important thing is to safeguard the civilian population and uphold the integrity of the United States. You have practically unlimited authority. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'll do my best. Good luck. I'll be listening. As I see it, Alice said, after Don had explained his connection with the Pentagon, Senator Thebold licked Hector Civic. Father, who defected from Hector, captured the senator and vice versa. But now the Gizzles have taken over from everybody, and you have to fight them all by your lonesome. Not fight them, Don said. Negotiate with them. 
But the Gizels are on Hector's side. It seems to come full circle. Where do you start? Superior had returned to an even keel, and Don helped her up. Let's start by taking a walk over to the bubblegum factory. We'll try to see the Gizzle in chief. There didn't seem to be anyone on the grounds of the McPherson place. The box car which had been on the siding near the factory was gone. It was probably at the bottom of the Atlantic by now, along with everything else that had been fastened down. Don wondered if Superior's gyrations had been strong enough to dislodge the train that had originally brought him to town. The Pennsylvania Railroad wouldn't be happy about that. They saw no one in the mansion and started for the basement room in which they had their talk with the Gizzle, passing through rooms where the furniture had been knocked about as if by an angry giant. They were stopped en route by Vincent Grand, ex-police chief, now Minister of Defense. All right, kids, he said, stick em up. Your Majesty, he called, look what I got. Hector Civic, crownless but still wearing his ermine, came up the stairs. Put your gun away, Vince. Hello, Alice. Hello, Don. Glad to see you survived the earthquake. I thought we were all headed for Kingdom Calm. Vince protested. This is that traitor Garrett's daughter. We could hold her hostage to keep her father in line. Nuts, the king said. I'm getting tired of all this foolishness. I'm sure Osborne Garrett is just as shaken up as we are, and that crazy senator, too. All I want now is for Superior to go back where it came from as soon as possible. And that's up to Gizzle, I'm afraid. Have you seen him since the excitement? Don asked. No, he went down that elevator of his when the submarine surfaced. I guess his control room, or whatever it is that makes Superior go, is down there. Let's take a look. Vince, will you put that gun away? Go help them clean up the mess in the kitchen. Vincent Grand grumbled and went away. In the basement room, Hector went to the corner and said, Hey, anybody down there? A deep voice said, Ascending, and the blue-gray kangaroo-like creature appeared. He stepped off the elevator section. Greeting, friend. Well, Hector said, I didn't know you could talk. Forgive my lack of frankness, Gizzle said. Alice, he said, bowing slightly, your majesty. Frankly, Hector said, I'm thinking of abdicating. I don't think I like being a figurehead. Not when everybody knows about it, anyhow. Major Court, Gizzle said. Don looked startled. What? How did you know? We have excellent communications. We thank your military for its assistance with the submarine. A pleasure, and we thank you and your people for saving us when we went flying. Mutuality of effort, Gizzle said. I'll admit a dilemma ensued when the submarine attacked, but our obligation to safeguard human lives outweighed the other alternative. Escape to the safety of space. Now, suppose we have our conference. You, Major, represent Earth. I, Rezar, represent the survivors of 4LZ. Agreed? Rezar, Don said. I thought your name was Gizzle. And what's Gorel Z? Little Marie Bendy called me Gizzle, Rezar said. She couldn't pronounce Gorel Z. I'm afraid I haven't been entirely candid with you about a number of things. But I think I know you better now. I heard your conversation with Foghorn Frank. Don smiled. Do you mean you've been listening in ever since I strapped on the transceiver? Oh, yes, Rezar said. So recapitulation is unnecessary. But we Gizzle, so-called, are still a mystery to you, of course. I suppose you'd like some background. Where from, where to, when, and all that. I certainly would, Don said. So would everybody else, I imagine, especially King Hector here. And Mr. Fogarty. By all means, let us communicate on the highest level, Rezar said. First, where from, eh? Right. Are you listening, Mr. Secretary? I sure am, Fogarty said. What's more, son, you're being piped directly into the White House and a few other places. Good, Rezar said. Now marvel at our saga. Chapter 12 The end of a civilization is a tragic thing. On the desert planet of Gorel Zed, the last world to survive the slow nova of its sun, the Gizzles, once the pest, but now through brain surgery, the possessors in their hardy bodies of the accumulated knowledge of the frail human being, were preparing to flee. Their self-supporting ships were ready, capable of crossing states to the ends of the universe. 
but their universe was barren. No planet could receive them. All were doomed as was theirs, Gorel Zed. They set out for a new galaxy, knowing they would not reach it but that their descendants might. They became nomads of space, self-sufficient. For generations they wondered, their population diminishing. Their scientist philosophers evolved the theory that accounted for their space-born ennui with life, their acceptance of their fate, their eventual doom. They had no roots, no place of their own. They had only the mechanistic world of their ships, which were vehicles, not a land. They must find a home of their own, or die. Several times in their odyssey they had come to a planet which could have housed them. But each time an injunction which had been built into them at the time of their brain surgery prevented them from staying. The doomed human beings on Gorel Zed had built into the very fiber of the Gizzles, who were, after all, only animals, the injunction that no human being could be harmed for their comfort. This meant that the world of Ladnora, whose gentle saffron inhabitants were incapable of offering resistance, could not be conquered. The Ladnorans, in their generosity, had offered the refugees from Gorel Zed a hemisphere of their own. But the Gizzles required a world of their own, not a half-world. They accepted the small continent only, and made it space-born, and took it with them. The Cabesians were the next to be visited. They ruled a belt of fertile land around the equator of their world. The rest was icy waste. The Gizzles took a slice of each polar region, and, joining them, made them space born. In time they reached the system of Saul. Mars attracted them first because of its sand. Mars was like Gorel Zed in many ways. But that very resemblance meant it was not for them. Mars was a dead world, as their own Gorel Zed had become. But the next planet they came to was a green planet. The Gizzles moored the acquisitions in the asteroid belt and visited Earth. Here at their planet fall, Australia was the perfect land. Even its inhabitants, the great kangaroos, the smaller wallabies, breathed home to the Gizzles. But there were also the human beings who had made the land their own. And though memory of their origin had weakened in the Gizzles, the injunction had not. For a time they set up a camp in the great central desert, and with delight found their legs again. Out of the cramped ships they came, to bound in freedom and fresh breathable air across the wasteland. But hardy, naked, black human beings lived in the desert, and they attacked the Gizzles with their primitive weapons. And when the Gizzles fled, not wishing to harm them, they came to white men, who attacked them with explosive weapons. And so they took to their ships and were space-born again. But the attraction of Earth was strong, and they sought another continent called North America, and in the center of it they found a great race whose technology was nearly as great as their own. These people had an intelligence and drive which rivaled that of their human antecedents whose minds had been transferred to the Gizzles' hardy, cumbersome bodies. Rezar paused. His intelligent eyes seemed misplaced in his heavy animal body. What attracted you to Superior of all places? Alice asked. Rezar seemed to smile. Two things, Cavalier and Bubblegum. What? Alice said. You're kidding. No, Rezar said. It's true. Bubblegum, because after generations of subsistence on capful food, our teeth had weakened and loosened, and Bubblegum strengthened them. Nourishment, no. Exercise, yes. And Cavalier Institute, because here were men who spoke in terms which paralleled the secret of our space drive. Alice laughed. This would make father expire of joy, she said, but you know he's just a phony. Alas, Rezar said, yes, alas, but he was so close. Magnology, cosmolineation, it's jargon merely as we learned in time. Osbert Garrett is mad, harmless but mad. Don asked Rezar, but if this built-in morality of yours is so strong, why didn't it prevent you from taking off with Superior? Rezar replied, There are factions among us now. An evolution of a sort, I suppose. 
Nothing is static. One faction, he tapped his chest, is completely bound by the injunction, but in the other, self-preservation places a limit on the injunction. The explanation seemed to be that the other faction, which grew in strength with every failure to find a world of their own, felt that on a planet such as Earth, with a history of men warring against men, required the Gizzles to be no more moral than the human inhabitants themselves. The good Gizzles versus the bad Gizzles? Alice asked. Rezar seemed to smile. The bad Gizzles, led by one called Paliz, had got the upper hand for a time and elevated superior, intending to join it to the bits and pieces of other planets they had previously collected and stored in the asteroid belt. But Rezar's influence had persuaded them not to head directly into space, at least not until they had solved the problem of how to put Superior's inhabitants ashore first. Don, unaccustomed to his new role of interplanetary arbitrator, said to me, I can't authorize you to take Superior if you do put us all ashore, but there must be a comparable piece of Earth we could let you have. But Superior is not all, Rezar said. To use one of your nautical expressions, Superior merely represents a shakedown cruise. Our ability to detach such a populated center had shown the feasibility of raising other typical communities. Magnetogors and Heidelberg, each a different example of Earth culture. Don heard a gas from the Pentagon, or it might have come from the White House. Does it mean you burrowed under each one of those communities? Don asked. Rezar shrugged. Kali's faction, he said, as if to dissociate himself from the project of removing some of Earth's choice of property. They aim at a history museum of habitable worlds. They're interplanetary souvenirs, Alice said, with quick frozen inhabitants. Don, what are you going to do? Don didn't even know what to say. His eyes met Hector's. Don't look at me, Hector said. I definitely abdicate. Look, Don said to Rezar, how far advanced are these plans? I mean, is there a deadline for this mass levitation? Twenty-four hours, your time, Rezar said. Can't you stop them? Aren't you the boss? The alien turned Don's question back to him. Are you the boss? Don had started to shake his head when Foghorn Frank's voice boomed out. Yes, by thunder, he is the boss. Don, raise your right hand. I'm going to make you a brigadier general. No, blast it, a full general. Repeat after me. General Don Court squared his shoulders. He was almost getting used to these spot promotions. Now, negotiate, Fogarty said. You hear me, Mr. Gizzle Rezar? The United States of America stands behind you, General Court. There was no audible objection from the White House. Who stands behind you? A democratic government, Rezar said, like yours. You represent them? Fogarty asked. With my counsel, yes. Then we can make a deal. Talk to him, Don. I'll shut up now. Don said to Rezar, Was it your decision to burrow under New York and Magnetogorsk and Heidelberg? I agreed to it, finally. But you agreed to it in the belief that the Earth people were a warring people, and that your old prohibitions did not apply. But we are not a warring people. Earth is at peace. Is it? Rezar asked sadly. Your plane warred on the submarine. In self-defense, Don said. Don't forget that we defended you, too, and we'd do it again, but not unless provoked. Rezar looked thoughtful. He tapped his long fingernails on the table. Finally, he said, I believe you, but I must talk to my people first, as you have talked to yours. Let us meet later. He seemed to be making a mental calculation. In three hours. Where? Here? How about Cavalier? Alice suggested. It would be the first important thing that ever happened there. For the first time since Superior took off, all of the town's elected or self-designated representatives met amicably. They gathered in the common room at Cavalier Institute as they waited for Rezar and his council to arrive for the talks which could decide not only the fate of Superior, but of New York and two foreign cities as well. Apparently the Pentagon expected Don to pretend he had authority to speak for Russia and Germany as well as the United States. But could he speak for the United States constitutionally? He was sure that Bobby Thebold 
comprising exactly one percent of that great deliberative body in the Senate, would let him know if he went too far, crisis or no crisis. The senator, reunited with Geneva Jervis, sat holding her hand on a sofa in front of the fireplace in which logs blazed cheerfully. Thebold looked untypically placid. Jen Jervis, completely sober and with her hair freshly reddened, had greeted Don with a cool nod. Thebold had been chagrined at learning that Don Court was not the yokel he had taken him for, but he recovered quickly, saying that if there was any one thing he had learned in his Senate career, it was the art of compromise. He would go along with the duly authorized representative of the Pentagon, with which he had always had the most cordial of relations. "'Isn't that so, sweetest of all the pies?' he said to Jen Jervis. Jen looked uncomfortable. "'Please, Bobby,' she said, "'not in public.' The senator squeezed her hand. Professor Garrett, whose wife and daughter were serving tea, stood with Ed Clark near the big bay window, through which they looked occasionally to see if the gizzles were coming. Maynard Ruback sat in a leather armchair next to Hector Civic, who had discarded his ermine and wore an old heavy tweed suit. Doc Bendy sat off in a corner by himself. He was untypically quiet. Don Court, despite his four phantom stars, was telling himself he must not let these middle-aged men make him feel like a boy. Each of them had had a chance to do something positive, and each had failed. Gentlemen, Don said, my latest information from Washington confirms that the Gizzles have actually tunneled under the cities they say their mutant faction wants to take up to the asteroid belt, just as they dug in under Superior before it took off. So they're not bluffing. How'd we find out about Magnetogorsk? Ed Clark asked. Iron Curtain getting rusty? Don told him that the Russians, impressed by the urgency of an unprecedented telephone call from the White House to the Kremlin, had finally admitted that their great industrial city was sitting on top of a honeycomb. The telephone conversation had also touched delicately of the subject of the submarine that had been sent, and there had been tacit agreement that the sub-commander had exceeded his authority in firing the missile, and that the sinking would not be referred to again. Maynard Ruback turned away from the window. Here they come, three of them but they're not coming from the direction of the McPherson place. They could have come up from under the grandstand, Don said. Miss Jervis and I found one of their tunnels there. Remember Jen? Jen Jervis colored slightly, and Don was sorry he'd brought it up. Yes, she said. I fainted, and Don, Mr. Court, a general court, helped me. I'm obliged to the general, Senator Thebold said. Professor Garrett went to the door. The three gizzles followed him into the room. Everybody stood up formally. There was some embarrassed scurrying around because no one had remembered that the Gizzles required backless chairs to accommodate their tail. The Gizzles, looking remarkably alike, sat close together. Don tentatively addressed the one in the middle. Gentlemen, he said, first, it is my privilege to award to you in the name of the President the Medal of Merit in appreciation of your quick action in saving uncounted lives during the submarine incident. The actual medal will be presented to you when we re-establish physical contact with Earth. Rezar, who it turned out was the one in the middle, accepted with a grave bow. Our regret is that we were unable to prevent the loss of many valuable objects as well, he said. Mr. Rezar, Don said, I haven't been trained in diplomacy, so I'll speak plainly. We don't intend to give up New York. Contrary to general belief, there are about eight million people who do want to live there, and I'm sure the inhabitants of Heidelberg and Magnetogorsk feel the same way about their cities. Then you yield superior, Rezar said. I didn't say that. Yield superior, and we will guarantee safe passage to Earth for all its inhabitants. We only want its physical facilities. We'll yield the bubblegum factory to help your dental problem, for suitable reparations, Don said. Payment will be made for any take. Give us Superior intact, including the factory and Cavalier Institute, and we will transport to any place you name an area of equal size from the planet Mars. Mars, Don said. That'd be a very valuable piece of real estate for the researchers. Take it, Don heard Frank Fogarty say from the Pentagon. Professor Garrett spoke up. If Cavalier goes, I go with it. I won't leave it. 
"'And I won't leave you, Osbert,' his wife said. "'Will there be air up there among the asteroids?' "'We are air breathers like you,' Rezar said. "'When we have assembled our planet there will be plenty. "'You will be welcome, Professor and Mrs. Gamp. "'Hector,' Don said, "'you're still mayor of Cavalier. "'What do you think?' "'They can have it,' Hector said. "'I'll take a nice steady civil service job with the federal government "'if you can arrange it.' "'Hector,' Ed Clark said, "'I think that sums up why you've never been a Holland success in politics. "'You don't give a damn for the people. "'All you care about is yourself.' "'Hector shrugged. "'You needn't be so holy-sounding, Eddie boy,' he said. "'Why isn't the sentry out this week? "'I'll tell you why. "'Because you've been so busy filing to the Trimble Grayson papers "'on Feeble's private radio "'that you haven't had time for anything else. "'How much are they paying you?' "'Ed Clark, deflated, muttered, News is news. Is that what you were doing in Senator Thebold's right room on the midway? Don asked Clark. Making this deal? Now, General, Thebold said, would you deprive the people of their right to know? Throughout my Senate career I have carried the torch against government censorship, which is the path to a totalitarian state. I'm sure part of the deal was that Clark's copy didn't make you anything less than a hero, Don said. Don't be too righteous, young man. Thebold said, lest ye be judged, as they say. Are you not at this moment bargaining away a piece of a sovereign state of the sovereign United States? I don't happen to represent Ohio, but if I did, I would rise in the upper chamber to demand your court-martial. At ease, Senator, Don ordered. You're not in the upper chamber now. You're on an artificial satellite which at any moment is apt to take off into outer space. Doc Mendy spoke up for the first time. Oops-a-daisy, you tell him, Donny boy. Superior, the town everybody looks up to. Don frowned at him. Mendy had sunk deep into his chair in his corner. He acknowledged Don's look with a broad smile that vanished in a hiccup. You don't have to say it, Donny. I've been drinking. Ever since Superior looped the looper and flung me feet over forehead into the beyond. Shattering experience to have nothing but a kangaroo hop between you and eternity. Yep, old Bendy's been on a bender ever since. But you carry on, boy. You're doing a great job. Thanks, Don said in irony. I guess that completes the roster of those qualified to speak for Superior. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ruback. Did you have something to say? But all the portly president of Cavalier had to say, though he said it at great length, was that if Cavalier were taken as part of a package deal, its trustees would have to receive adequate compensation. Professor Garrett tugged at his sleeve and said, Sit down, Maynard. They've already said they'll pay. Fogarty's voice rumbled at Don. Let's try to speed things up, General. Close the deal in Superior, at least before the press gets there. The press? The rest of the papers couldn't let the Trimble, Grace, and Chain keep their exclusive. Clark's going to have lots of company soon. The boys have hired a birdie plane, first one off the assembly line. You've seen it. Lands anywhere. Okay, I'll try to hurry it up. To the gizzle, Don said, All right, you take Superior, minus his people, and bring us a piece of Mars. Agreed, Rezar said. It was as easy as that. Nobody objected. To many of Superior's self-proclaimed saviors had been caught with their motives showing. You've got to give up New York, though, Don said. He felt as if he were playing a game of interplanetary monopoly. We'll give you a chunk of the great central desert instead, if Australia's willing. Would that come under the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, Mr. Secretary? Complete with kangaroos and assorted wallabies, if you want them. Agreed, said Rezar. Don sighed quietly to himself. It should be smooth sailing now that the hurdle of New York has passed. But Calise, the one Alice had called the bad gizzle, shook his head violently and spoke for the first time. No, he said firmly, we must have New York. It is by far the greatest of our conquests, and I will not yield it. Rezar said sharply, we have forsworn conquest. I am tired of your mortalizing, Calise said. We are dealing with beings whose greatest respect is for power. If we temporize now, we will lose their respect. They will think our new world weak and itself open to conquest. We have the power. Let us use it. I say, take New York and its people and hold them hostage. The city is ready for lifting. 
No, Don said. You can't have New York. Feliz seemed to smile. We already have it. It's merely a question of transporting it. He put a long-fingered hand to his furry chest, where, almost hidden in the blue-gray fur, was a flat, perforated disc. He said into them, Show them that New York is ours. Wait, Rezar said. Merely a demonstration, Feliz told him, for the moment at least. Frank Fogarty's voice, alarmed, said urgently, Tell him we believe him. New York's reporting an earthquake, or something very like it. For God's sake, tell him to put it back while we reorient our thinking. Feliz nodded in satisfaction. The city is as it was. Our people under New York raised it a mere fraction of an inch. It could as easily have been a mile. Do not underestimate our power. Rezar was agitated. We came in peace, he said to his fellow Gizzle. Let us not leave in war. There's power on both sides capable of untold destruction. Neither must use it. We are a democratic people. Let us vote. I say we must not take New York. And I say we must, police hold him, in self-interest. They turned to a third of their people who had been looking from one to the other, his eyes reflecting indecision. Feliz barked at him. Well, Eziel, vote. Eziel said, I abstain. Deadlock. Don was sweating. He looked at the others in the room. They were tense but silent, apparently willing to leave it up to Don and his link with the Defense Department. Frank Pogarty's voice said, Sack has been airborne in total strength for half an hour, General. It was a purely precautionary alert at the time. Don started to interrupt. I know they hear me, the Secretary of Defense said. I intend that they should. We don't want to fight, but we will if we must. Son? The rough voice halted for a moment. If necessary, we'll destroy Superior to kill this alien and save New York. As a soldier, I hope you understand. It's the lives of three thousand people against the lives of eight million. Only Don and the Gizzle had heard. Don looked across the room and into Alice's eyes. She gave him a tentative smile, noting his grave expression. Yes, sir, Don said finally. Rezar spoke. This is folly. He touched the disc in the fur on his own chest. No, Kaliz cried. It is time, Rezar said. We are beginning to fail in our mission. He spoke reverently into the disc. My lord, awake. Kaliz said quickly, Raise New York, take it up. They will not obey you now, Rezar said. I have invoked the counsel of the master. The man was frail and incredibly old. He had sparse white hair and a deeply lined face, but his eyes were alert and wise. He wore a cloak-like garment of soft, warm-looking material. His expression was one of kindliness but strength. The doorbell had rung and Mrs. Garrett had answered it. The old man had walked slowly into the room, followed respectfully by two gizzles. My lord, said Rezar. He got to his feet and bowed, as did the other gizzles. I had hoped to let you sleep until your new world had been prepared for you. But the risk was great that, if I delayed, your world would never be. Forgive me. You did well, the old man said. Don stood up too, feeling the sense of awe that this personage inspired. How do you do, sir, he said. How do you do, General Court? You know my name? I know many things, too many for such a frail old body. But someone had to preserve the heritage of our people, and I was chosen. Won't you sit down, sir? I'll stand, thanks. I've rested long enough. Generations, as a matter of fact. Shall I answer some of your obvious questions? I'd better say a few things quickly before Falkhorn Frank hits the panic button. Don smiled. Can he hear you, or shall I repeat everything? Oh, he hears me. I've got gadgets galore, even though I'm between planets at the moment. I must say it's a pleasure to be among people again. He nodded pleasantly around the room. Mrs. Garrett smiled to him. Would you like a cup of tea? Later, perhaps, thank you. First, I must assure you and everyone of Earth that no one will be harmed by us and that we want nothing for our new world that you are not willing to give. That's good to hear, Don said. 
I gather you've been in some kind of suspended animation since you left your old world, so I wonder how you're able to speak English. Everything was suspended but the subconscious. That kept perking along, absorbing everything the gizzles fed into it. And they've been absorbing your culture for ten years, so I'm pretty fluent, and I certainly know enough to apologize for all the inconvenience my associates have caused you in their zeal to re-establish the human race of Gorel Zed. In the case of Kaliz, of course, it was excessive zeal which will necessitate this rehabilitation. Your pardon, Master, Kaliz said humbly. Granted, but you'll be rehabilitated anyway. Don asked, Did I understand you to say you plan to re-establish your race? Do you mean there are more of you aside from the kangaroo people? Yes, young people, the youngest of all from Gorel Zed. They were put to sleep like me to be ready to carry on when their new were built. I won't wake them till then. I hope to live that much longer. I'm sure you will, sir. Kind of you, but let's get on with the horse trading. Of course we won't take New York or the two other cities. There was a collection of sighs of relief from Washington. But we would like some of your uninhabited jungle land, the lusher the better, to help us out in the oxygen department. We'd also like some of your air if you can spare it. We've got a planet to supply now, not just ships. How would you get air across space? Don asked. At the moment, the master said, I'm afraid we're not prepared to barter our scientific knowledge. I didn't mean it to bribe. It just didn't seem to be something you could do. Do you think we could spare some air, Mr. Secretary? I'll have to ask the science boys about that one, Frank Fogarty said. Meanwhile, it's okay with Australia on the desert, but your gizzle friends have to agree to relocate the aborigines from that trap, and they must take every last rabbit or it's no deal. Agreed, the master said with a smile. But please ask the stockmen to hold their fire. My friends only look like kangaroos. As Don and the master were making arrangements for Superior to touch down so its people could be transferred to Earth, a blaze of light stabbed down from the sky. Through the window they saw the vertiplane settling slowly to the campus. It sure beats a blimp, Senator Thebold said in admiration. Professor Garrett got up to look. It's the press, he said to his wife. You might as well invite them in. I hope we have enough tea. The vertiplane's door opened, and the first wave of reporters spilled out. End of chapter 12. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.